Okay, what's up? Had a break in there, uh, giving some updates. Um, the previous slide set, uh, the audio cut out right about here. So I'm gonna um, pick up from where it was bad. So uh, talking about prototypes in the, uh, this, the, this particular phase of the SDLC, right? This can be really, really useful um, because um, early on here, when if you can get user experience with something, um, they can get it in their hands. Um, they can, you know, see the software. They can, they can have some sort of prototype um, to 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 look at how feasible is it to do. Um, this is this is really really useful um, early on. You know, uh, the the more that you can get something in your hand and see whether or not it works um before you go you know all the way down the road and and have totally developed it the more useful it's going to be not only to know it, can can we actually do this is it going to fit in with the organization is it do we have the technical capability to 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 make this happen um it helps you understand what you know functionality you might need that you might not know that you need until you had your hands on something um so this is um, the role of a prototype at this early phase of the SDLC. Um, interviewing plays an important part uh, in the in the uh, SDLC because uh, you need to get insight into what people do. You need to get insight into um, how they might use a program, how they might use software. So understanding their roles and their jobs um plays an important part of it all so here's a for your viewing pleasure uh you might need to pause me if there's no sound on this but let's let's give this a go Okay, so uh, it, interviewing, although it plays an important role, um, can be challenging, right? Like sometimes it's hard to sit down and just say, hey, you know, what do you do? What do you need the program to do? Um, so interviewing does play its part, but so does, you know, direct observation. Sometimes you need to just sit down and, and watch someone do what they do. Um, you know, that can prove fruitful. Have you ever tried to explain somebody what you do, what your job is? It can be challenging. Uh, next phase of the SDLC, the component design phase. So this is where from the requirements analysis phase, you have your approved user requirements. Um, you know, maybe there was a prototype involved and, and from that you got further information on what their requirements might be. You might have done some interviewing and now you understand what the actual requirements are going to be. And this goes into the component design. Here you're looking at, you know, what hardware might you need? What are the program specification? Um, you're looking at designing the database and, and those database procedures. You're looking at uh, the different jobs and, and, and creating job uh, definitions. This is, um, from this stage, you will end up with a, a system design 
Um, again, it's not a system yet, but you have a full system design that's ready to go on to the next phase. Um, here, you're looking also at um, where you can maybe source some of your your program, um, uh, th th some, some programs that you might need. Um, there are different sources. Like you can, sometimes you can just go buy off the shelf software and it works, right? Um, as you're looking at user requirements, maybe they need something that, you know, Microsoft Excel would be perfectly fine for. Um, uh, but sometimes it needs something a little more specific. So there is uh, off the shelf software that, that allows uh, customization, uh, allows alteration. Um, and so that that is always a possibility. Um, if one of those two options doesn't work off the shelf, off the shelf with, all, with, with some sort of alteration, customization to that off the shelf program, um, you go through and custom develop all of the different programs that you need. So this is um, you know, where you write the code for the program that you're going to need. Prototyping in this um, phase is, is very useful as well. Um, in this phase of component design, you're, you, we, we mentioned this, but again, job descriptions. What are the various people going to be doing? So including those in the, in, in the um, specifications before you go on to this implementation phase, um, it is critical. Uh, next phase, implementation. So you have your finished component design and now it's time to put it into, you know, actually build the thing. This is the implementation. This is where you, your designs become reality. Um, you're building system components. You're doing testing and creating your test plan. Um, how are you going to test it? Um, you're looking at um, how you're you're going to transition to the new system once the new system is is, is finished. So this is you know this is where uh, you know no more changes can be made. And if they are made here, it's super super costly, right? Like everything's been scheduled and done and and checked off, and now the system is being created and tested. When you do um, uh, launch the system and you're uh, uh, converting to the new system, there are different approaches that you can use. And companies will do different things for different reasons, right? Um, one way that you can do it is a parallel implementation. Um, this is where you have your old software system and you have all your employees you're using the old SIF system. And then you bring the new system online and there's they start using the new system kind of at the same time. So if they're like entering data, old system, entering data, new system. Um, and, they're, and they're doing both systems as they get you know, familiar with whatever the new system is doing. Um, it is, uh, it's a safe approach to converting to a new system, but it's very expensive because you're, you're running everything, all of the hardware and everything that, that's involved in the old system. You have to run all of that um, and your employees are still using all of that. And then there's the new system and you're running all of that and your employees are using all of that. And so it's, it's safe, but it's an expensive approach. But, you know, companies will sometimes do this for years before they finally pull the trigger and say, okay, we're fully on the new system. We're going to turn off the old system. So that's a parallel approach. Uh, another way to do it is the plunge or direct approach. And this is where you know, everyone goes home on Friday night and your IT team comes in and over the weekend and they totally take the old system offline and um, bring the new system online. And uh, Monday morning, everyone comes in and it's the log into the new system. Um, it's it's very high risk, right? Um, because what if it doesn't quite work? What if there are errors or bugs that were unforeseen? Um, it's great if it works because it's, you know, all of a sudden your brand new shiny system is up and running and everyone's using it. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty risky approach. Um, and so you, companies might want to consider, you know, what, what, you know, where are they implementing this? What, what systems are not vital to company operation? 
And if it's maybe not vital, then maybe they can try this approach. But again, there's really high risk um, because there's no system to fall back on if the new one somehow doesn't work. Uh, a third way is a phased approach. So this is where um, the system is slowly, um, the old system is slowly phased out. And the new system, as the new system comes online in different modules or phases, every piece is tested. And so it's like, you're using the old system for most things, but then for that one particular, you know, you know, customer information or so, I don't know, whatever it is, you use the new system. And then a month later, it's like, you're using the old system for most things, except for those two other things now. And so you slowly start phasing out the old system and moving into the new system. Uh, a fourth way that companies can do this is a pilot approach. And this is where um, you have an old system that, it, you know, most people are using in all locations, except there's like maybe a single location, a pilot location, and they're going to start totally using the new system. And, you know, if it works, then maybe they can now roll that out to everyone else. But at least there's, it, it limits the exposure if there's problems company-wide. Um, and it gives the company a chance to test out that new system in a live environment at, at a single location um, with, you know, real data to see how it how it works. So, again, there's no right or wrong way to, to do this. And uh, managers will decide, you know, one approach over another approach for a variety of reasons, money, time, um, you know, their their aversion to risk. Um, but again, there's no right answer here. Last phase of the uh, SDLC is the, the maintenance phase. So this is where all of the systems that you use right now, this is where they live. Um, this is where uh, Canvas, right? Canvas is in the maintenance phase. Uh, any programs and software programs that you're using at work right now, it's, it's all in the maintenance phase, right? Like if it's live and active and you're using it, it's in the maintenance phase where, you know, sometimes things come up and you need to uh, put a fresh coat of paint on it, or you need to do, you know, slight changes to the system. You need to enhance it slightly. Um, you need to patch it. You need to, um, uh, you know, plug some of the, 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 the errors that might have you know, been coded into the system initially, but um, for the most part, you're just, it's its upkeep on the system. Um, you're not, it's not a, you're not changing out the, this is where everyone's using it. It's live. Um, it's, it's, you know, this is where it's living until you decide that you need, uh, you know, a, a new system again. Okay, so, Let's talk about what it takes to be successful with a SDLC project. Uh, one thing that's that's very, very useful is um, being able to manage. I mean, SDLC is it, it's huge, right? It's it's a it's an approach that and we'll talk about it in a moment, but that it's being phased out for a variety of reasons, but it's 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 a massive undertaking to kind of envision a system from the very beginning um, and go through this big, long project to actually create a new live system. So breaking things down into um, small tasks that you can actually understand and manage is essential. So this is what a work breakdown structure is. Um, every task that you break it down into will have different deliverables. Um, you, you know, this person is responsible for this particular thing, and these are the deliverables that's going to be given at this particular point in time so that we can stay on track, on budget, on schedule. So you're looking at time, you're looking at costs. Um, uh, you have this, your work breakdown structure has the, the plan for your project, um, how it's going to happen, who's involved, when are things going to be um, completed. You always have to be willing to adjust your plan um, because things come up, right? So there's going to be trade-offs. Um, someone might want, you know, some new fancy uh, menu in the, in, in, in the system, but th there might be trade-offs that like, do we have the budget for it? Do we have the time to code that in? 
And so you have to be willing. And if you do, maybe like you have to adjust, right? So there's going to be th that adjustment. Um, there's development challenges. You know, what happens when um, things that are being developed, that, that something goes wrong? What happens when, um, uh, you know, the, someone leaves when the code doesn't work? So there's all sorts of different things that might creep up that you have to be able to manage. Here's a, an example of what a work breakdown structure uh, might look like. You can see that there are, um, you know, different phases here. Um, they're looking at, uh, you know, different milestones that need to be, you know, completed. Um, another thing that, that is useful is a Gantt chart. So this is a Gantt chart helps you have track over who is doing what thing and how long have they had that thing and are there some critical paths? Are there people that need to finish their thing before someone else can do whatever they need to do? And so a Gantt chart helps you track all of that. The the trade-offs, you know, there's always this trade-off between time, cost and scope, right? Um, if you need something done really quickly, it's probably gonna cost a lot of money and um, you probably can't get all of the bells and whistles, right? Um, if you want all of the bells and whistles and want it done quickly, then the money goes up you know, exponentially. So there's, th there's this relationship between uh, time, cost, and scope that you need to be realistic about and managers need to understand. Um, if they are tight on cost, um, then they need to understand that, um, they need to keep those requirements down, right? Uh, and, and, and understand that, that relationship. Um, there's always, um, challenges that creep up right there's coordinating schedules coordinating people coordinating um you know work that needs to go together so you you have to be able to manage those that that coordination um diseconomies of scale this refers to sometimes when a project's late um it does no good to just like add people to the project right if if you're behind it does no good to just like bring in someone new it's just going to put you behind even more you can't just throw people at a problem that's already late and think that more people is going to solve the problem. Um, there's something else that's happening. More people is going to slow it down, right? It's going to get, you know, there's now there's new people to bring on board and to bring up to speed and to get trained and to now there's more coordination that has to happen, right? So um, managers have a tendency to be like, well, you guys didn't finish it. Here's some more people. Uh, now finish it. And that's not true, right? That That's not going to help at all. Um, configuration control. Uh, unexpected events, team morale, all of these things, right? Managers, uh, especially project managers, have to be good at, at handling all of these things. So coordination, geographic differences, cultural differences, coordinating different people and, and their, their work of different groups, um, delays, um, th this all falls under coordination. Uh, I kind of talked about diseconomies of scale. Um, Schedules can only compress so far. Once you're late and over budget, there are a few good choices and throwing more people at it is, is not going to work. Uh, configuration control, unexpected events. So configuration con control refers to um, management policies, practices, uh, different tools um, to help manage, maintain control over your project resources. Uh, and then unexpected events, you know, what happens if the company gets bought out? There's new management. What happens if there's this, you know, dramatic change in technology or the competition changes? There's a disaster. Um, what happens if you're, you know, building this system and now like COVID-19 happens and like no one's there anymore? Uh, so there's there's all sorts of things that, that can that can come up. So the, the SDLC 
um, it was kind of, it was great, right? Like when we first were developing software programs, it was the most methodical way that we thought that we could develop programs. Um, however, there are new uh, methodologies that have proved to be much more uh, efficient and rapid and um, uh, adaptable. And so the the SDLC really is, though, yeah, some companies are still using it, right? Um, but there are other approaches that are, are preferable um, because you know, the nature of technology and the technology world is so rapidly evolving that requirements always change. They will change. And the SDLC doesn't handle that very well, right? Uh, and so the alternatives, we'll, we'll talk about some of their, they're all different agile methodologies. Agile just refers to the ability to, to um, deal with uncertainty, ambiguity, um, uh, the, the methodologies rapid application development, unified uh, process, extreme programming, Scrum. Um, really, it's about um, designing as, as, as you go along and then testing as you go along and delivering like small workable pieces of, of code or small workable pieces of not just code, but like little tiny pieces of software that actually work for a thing. It's, so if like you were building a house this way, um, it's like, what is the most important part of your house? Well, I need a bedroom and a bathroom. And so, you know, you build a bedroom and a bathroom and in modules. And then you're like, okay, I got these two modules. And then like, here comes the kitchen module. All right, let's build the kitchen module and let's plug that in. So it would be like if you could build a house in like little modules that then you could like Lego together. Um, this is kind of how agile development works. We build little things in, in, in tiny modules, what's most important, what works well, and then we can continue from there. Okay, uh, this is a good video. Um, I doubt the sound is gonna work, I'm gonna play it, um, but go ahead and if the sound is not working, just pull up your slides and play it with me so that you can have sound.
Okay, that was like a really good explanation of Scrum. Um, it it talked about the different you know work periods. It talked about um, you know testing. It talked about the, you know the, those different sprints. Um, you know, it talked about how really Scrum, this agile development methodology, is about looking at you know, helping the customer being whatever you're, you know, helping your customer be happy. And so um, that's why it's, it's, that's why it's preferable. Um, you have these short periods um, where you get some, at the end of the period, there's something to deliver. There's something to look at. There's something to use that's, that's useful. Um, so it's a very useful methodology. Here are those different scrum processes. You can see why it's preferable to the SDLC. <clears throat> the video talked about the the the, the standups that happen every day. Um, uh, there's paired programming where there are programmers that are together. Um, um, writing the pro software program together, um, um, working as a team, um, demonstrating that the that the software works, um, that the code is useful. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's there's really always somebody to fall back on. These scrum periods continue until the customer is totally satisfied and says, awesome, like, I'm good. We don't need to fix anything else. Like, what you've done is perfect. And, um, you know, I we don't need to develop anything else. Uh, or um, maybe the project runs out of money. If you run out of money in the SDLC, but you still don't have a program, then what do you do? You have to spend more money. But with scrum... Um, if you run out of money, you still have a lot of other small modules, deliverables, packages, programs that have been created along the way. So you have useful things. Um, or maybe you've run out of time. And if you've run out of time, that's okay. Same, same situation. If you run out of time with the SDLC and you don't have anything, you're out of luck, right? But with Scrum, you have something. Okay. Last thing, looking forward, um, 2029, uh, what does it look like, you know, uh, out a few years in the future? What does development look like? Are we still going to be doing SDLC? Are we still going to be, you know, doing Scrum? Are we still going to be writing programs? Um, we're, we're actually seeing this, the beginnings of this already, that we're seeing um, systems being developed in different ways. We're seeing systems that rather than people writing code for systems, we're seeing systems that are actually just trained. Um, uh, they, they're using machine learning to learn the rules of, of the world in, in which they operate. And then the, the, the machine itself writes its own programs. Um, but this, again, these are early stages. And so You'll see this shift from where we see it now in kind of a more research area to, you know, training uh, systems that we use on a daily basis. Uh, we're going to see shifts in the nature of the IT industry, um, you know, much more agile development, um, service oriented architecture, web services. That's going to be much bigger than uh, you know, all of this traditional methodology that we're still kind of doing now and we're slowly phasing out, um, you know, that's going to be largely phased out. We're going to see systems that come online very, very rapidly because of how agile we're able to create um, programs. So uh, it's, it's, it's exciting. I think that, um, you know, the development is is going to be more focused on like what is the user experience like rather than um can we get you know uh you know can we just get it to work right it'll work but it but we need more focus on does it work with us does it work and and help us do what we need it to do so 
It's an exciting time. Okay. That is it for, uh, that is it for now. Um, what we have coming up is the, your tests, right? So test on chapters, uh, nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, so the quiz for obviously chapter 12, but the test for 9, 10, 11, 12. So make sure that um, you're prepared. There's the study guide that's online. Um, please use that. It's in the files tab on Canvas. Um, there's some extra credit opportunities also on Canvas. Make sure you take advantage of those. Um, you know, the ask a friend a favor. Um, so, so look at look at those extra credit opportunities and and take advantage of all of those extra credit opportunities. Uh, as this is the last uh, video for the semester, it's been it's it's been great uh, having you in class. It's it's always weird, like you know, online class. Like I I don't get to know you as well as I wish I did, right? But it's been great having you. I've enjoyed um i i've enjoyed it and if i can do anything for you please reach out i'm seriously i'm one of those people that i don't say it just to say it. i actually mean it reach out and I, i'm here to help you uh, i want you to be successful i got into teaching because i love it and i love helping people be successful in whatever they're doing so if i can do anything to help please reach out i'm happy to help all right everybody thank you